السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم بارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين the brief time I have with all of you the discussion that I'm going to have with all of you is about Ramadan and the family everywhere we look today the family unit is broken we have a divorce rate of one in four people one in four couples experiencing divorce we have single mothers looking after children up and down the country we have Muslim families themselves living together but still fragmented husband and wife like housemates living in different rooms of the house everywhere we look it doesn't spell it doesn't look very good the state of the family today Ramadan is an opportunity to change that Ramadan is an opportunity to revive the bonds within the family and revive that community experience on a large scale and on a smaller scale within the family. The first, I'm going to divide my talk into three points. The first of those points is I call build versus buy. Build versus buy. This is a famous uh, phrase used in companies when they want to, let's say, they want to get some software, let's say to do some accounting or in order to look at their operations. They say, do we build the software in-house or do we buy it from elsewhere? Buying is always a shortcut. It's quick, it's easy. You get it off the shelf, done. Building takes longer, it's more tiring. You have to build the expertise from the ground up. You have to train people, you have to be patient. As a Muslim community, as parents, as families, what is the approach that we take when it comes to tarbiyah, the nurturing and the development of our families? The vast majority of us, we buy, we don't build. Parents today are glorified drivers, picking their children up and dropping them from madrasa, from football, from school, from chess class, from this class and the other class. So much so that the only quality time a parent gets with their child is perhaps in the car, during which the parent is shouting at the child to shut up in the back seat while I drive, please, because I'm trying to reverse my car. Psychologists say that on average today, the average parent gets 15 minutes of one-to-one -one time with the child. As we enter into Ramadan, we have to change this narrative. And to do that, we have to recall one of the greatest examples of fathers that we have had in the history of Islam. I want to take you many thousand years, thousands of years ago to the father of all prophets, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he discusses Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran, Allah says, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَاعِيلُ وَإِسْمَاعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ as Ibrahim alayhi salam, I want you to imagine this moment. Ibrahim alayhi salam on the command of Allah has left his child and his wife in the middle of the Arabian desert. And after many years, he returns to this desert with another instruction to finally build the house of God himself to build the Kaaba. Now he has two options. He can hire a bunch of contractors, pay them a daily wage, and somebody else can build the house for him, or he can build it himself with his own hands. He looks at his son Ismail, small lad, small grubby hands. How much is he going to be able to contribute to the building of this massive house that's going to be the Kaaba, the house of Allah for centuries to come? It's probably a smarter move to just ignore him and tell him to stay at home with mom while Ibrahim alayhi salam does the heavy lifting himself. But no, Ibrahim alayhi salam brings Ismail alayhi salam to the construction site and brick by brick, they build the Kaaba together. When Allah mentions this in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delays the name of Ismail. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ Because it was unexpected. It wasn't part of the plan. But Ismail alayhi salam, this small child was brought into the construction project for one reason only. When you build something in-house, 
when children watch their parents sweat for the sake of Allah, bleed for the sake of Allah, weep for the sake of Allah, tire for the sake of Allah, lose sleep for the sake of Allah, that child is never going to forget that sight for the rest of their life. It will be imprinted, embedded in the fabric of their memory for years to come. Children do not remember stories, words on a textbook, blind ink on a white page, no. Children remember most the live blood of their parents as they move and as they sway and as they bow in front of the Almighty. And this is what shaped Ismail alayhi salam. Look at Musa alayhi salam. His mother, Ummi Musa, an understudied figure in the Quran. As Ummi Musa herself stands in front of the river Nile with her child in her hands. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِيهِ فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي إِنَّا رَادُّوهُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَاعِلُوهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Allah commands the mother of Moses, Ummi Musa, that start to nurse this child so that his cries do not alert the guards. But if you fear for him, do the opposite of what you would naturally do. Don't hold him tight, throw him into the river. One day we will return him to you as a messenger. Fast forward, fast forward a few decades. Musa alayhi salam finds himself in a very similar situation, standing in front of an ocean, and Allah tells him, jump in, don't run away. This movement, this action of Musa to trust Allah and to jump into the ocean is the same thing his mother did decades ago when she threw her son into the ocean. As parents do, so too, so too the children will imitate. As Ibrahim salam builds the Kaaba, so too his son one day builds the Muslim civilization. If we become glorified delivery drivers, delivering our children from point to point with having very little quality time with them, what are we building within them? We have outsourced so much of our tarbiyah, the nurturing of the future generation. We have outsourced their Quranic education. We have outsourced their skills. We have outsourced their secular learning. We've outsourced so much. What has, been, what has left for us to give them? There is nothing left for us to give them. This Ramadan has to be a game changer for every family that is hearing this. There are so many ways that we can cultivate a family environment in Ramadan. And the first of those is that the family unit has to be a complementary, a cooperating unit. It should not be the case that a brother or a gentleman or a husband or a father is getting all the peaceful worship while his wife, the mother, is slaving away in the kitchen to produce 16 dishes for the iftar platter. It's got to be teamwork. The children have to be part of the journey. We cannot outsource their religious learning. There should be a weekly, a daily circle with the family. With younger children, stories work really well. And with older children, a Quranic circle works really well. For many parents in the audience, when we share this idea, sit with your family daily, weekly, have a competition in the household, have a goal to reflect on some Quran together. The first thing that comes to our mind is imposter syndrome. I don't know. How am I going to teach my child? I feel like an imposter. That's why I'm paying the Mawlana. That's why I'm paying the Masjid. That's why I'm dragging them to the conference because I don't have anything to give them. You do have something to give them. The Prophet Sallallahu said, بَلِّغُوا anni walaw ayah." Convey from me even if it is one verse. The one verse that a parent recites to their child is a verse the child will remember till the day they die. The one verse a child hears at the conference will be forgotten 30 minutes from now. You are much more powerful, much more impactful, much more effective than your children. So build that Ramadan environment at home, that weekly, daily Quran circle, that story time with the kids. Build it, don't buy it, don't outsource it. Some things can never be outsourced. The second point I want to make is called fixing the food culture. When many of us think of Ramadan, we think of feasting. 
There are particular dishes in every culture that we never see in the year except in the month of Ramadan. Ramadan, unique, exclusive. The pakore, the samose, the kanji, whatever you want to call it. Special soups, special fried dishes that only turn up in Ramadan. Yes, it's understandable. We're hungry, so we want to have more textures, more flavors. But when we think about the damage this culture does, and this is where culture, and human culture, can really do a damage to the purpose of the month of Ramadan. The purpose of the month is for us to go hungry. And instead, the month is turned into a feasting ritual. The feast is supposed to be happening on Eid, not at iftar time. And to understand the impact of this culture, the impact is mostly, the brunt is mostly borne and felt by the ladies, by the mothers, by the wives, who have to slave over the stove for six, eight, ten, four, three hours a day to cook a variety of dishes. This Ramadan, I'm going to challenge you, it's called the one dish challenge. On the table, there should just be one dish. One dish, every day. No more, no condiments, no sauces, no special soups, no fried fritters. Try it for a month. Why? When you strip away all of the extra stuff from Ramadan, Ramadan becomes about the core bit, the fast. It becomes about the hunger. It becomes about the God consciousness. Food is just a means. It's a break, but we have to rush off to prayer. And if we fill our bellies, what example are we setting for the kids? What example are we setting for the ladies? What example are we setting for the men? Where we have created around Ramadan a, f a foodie culture. That foodie culture has to go, brothers and sisters. We know that the Prophet wasallam. if I take you for a moment to the food culture in the house of the Prophet wasallam, he would wake up some days and ask Aisha, Oh Aisha, is there any food at home? She would say, nope. He would say, I'm fasting today. How many gentlemen in this audience can do that? The Prophet wasallam, as it comes in, in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, that months would go by and nothing would be cooked in his house. The fire would never be lit. What would he live on? On dates and water, al-aswadan. Simplicity, minimize, cut it down, live a minimal Ramadan rather than adding all of the bells and whistles to the food and to everything else that we do, the festivities, such that Ramadan becomes a month of stress and cooking and feasting and we forget about the core, the Quran and the Salah and the Dua. So first point was build, don't buy. Build the Ramadan culture at home, don't outsource it. Number two, Fix the food culture. Return to the minimal food culture of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And lastly, but not least, I want to emphasize one last point. When it comes to Ramadan and the family, when it comes to Ramadan and your children, and as a household, one of the most important parts of living Ramadan as a family is engaging our children and ourselves in understanding the Quran. Many of us, we grew up with this idea, with this goal that in Ramadan, we're going to recite the entire Quran. But what that does for children, for youngsters within our family, and for everybody within the family, it creates a culture where the Quran is meant to be recited, not understood. I would say this Ramadan, add an additional goal. Have a goal to recite a portion of the Quran but have a goal to understand and reflect on certain chapters of the Qur'an. It could be five chapters of the Qur'an. Five short chapters. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٍ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Every week we're going to understand, reflect and discuss the meanings of one surah as a family. We know that this Qur'an, if we understand what was it revealed for, Allah informs us in the Qur'an itself. كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته ليدبروا آياته وليتذكر أولو الألباب. The Quran was revealed in order for people to reflect on its meanings. That's the purpose of the Quran. The recitation, the memorization, the prayer is a means to an end. It's a pathway to the meaning of the Qur'an. It's not the end goal itself. How many of us can say confidently that we can explain the verse Allahus Samad? Allahus Samad. This is the test. It's called the Samad test. Go home 
And as a family, ask everybody in the family, what is the meaning of Allah Samad? This is the short, one of the shortest chapters of the Quran. All of us have memorized it. It's one third of the Quran in its meaning, in the weight of its meanings. Just tell me, what does that one word mean? Allah Samad. And if we realize we don't know the meaning of Allah Samad, we have exposed our own ignorance. We have exposed our own priorities. For many of us, our relationship with the Quran is superficial. It is recitation, but we're not bothered about the meaning. It is memorization, we're not bothered about its principles and its teaching. This is the very culture that led those before us, the Jews and Christians, down the rabbit hole of completely disconnecting with their scripture. Allah says in the Quran, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِي وَإِنْ هُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ There are people from the Jews and Christians, all they know of their scripture is empty recitation. It's an empty ritual. It's empty hopes. They don't know the meaning of what is inside that scripture. When Allah describes in the Quran such people, He says, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاةَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا People who were given the Torah, revelation from God, but they did not take responsibility to understand it. كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَسْفَارًا They are like donkeys carrying books. Imagine. What happens to a donkey if you put an encyclopedia on the back of a donkey? Number one, a donkey cannot understand what's inside the encyclopedia. And number two, it feels the book on its back is a burden, it's a chore, it's a weight, it's an, it's an annoyance. For many of us, in our families, we have created that culture that the Qur'an is a chore. It's an annoyance, it's something you don't have to understand, but you have to do it because Baba and Mama said you have to do it. Do we laugh? Are we surprised when our children drag their heels to their Qur'an lesson? When all their relationship with the Qur'an is one of pure recitation and they have never been told the meaning of a single verse of the Qur'an. This has to change this Ramadan. Reflect on the meanings of the Qur'an as a family. Don't only suffice with the recitation. This is not minimizing the reward for recitation and the impact of recitation and the power of the recitation but it's a means, it's not the end. Don't forget the purpose, don't forget the objective of the Qur'an was to make us think, to provoke our minds, to provoke our hearts. Even if the goal is minimal, reflect on one surah this Ramadan, two surahs, three, four, five, but don't neglect the meanings of the Qur'an. Lest our children grow up and say, oh the Qur'an, that storybook, I don't really know what it means. But as a kid, I had to read it. As a child, I had to read the Arabic. I have no clue what it actually means. This actually happened to me once, no less than with an Arab. I was at lunch at work, having lunch with my colleagues. And a non-Muslim colleague asks me, hey, you know the Quran? Is that a book like everybody reads and understands? Or is it only for like the clergy? And a colleague of mine who was an Arab turns to this non-Muslim and he says, yeah, the Quran is only for scholars. Us simple people don't understand it. Ya Allah, what will we say in front of Allah? What will we say when we meet the Messenger of Allah? And the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala complains to Allah in the Qur'an. Inna qawmi attakhadu hadha al-Qur'an mahjura. Oh Allah, my people have abandoned this Qur'an. They haven't abandoned its recitation, they haven't abandoned its memorization, but they forgot the very reason that it was revealed. To summarize my points, number one, build the relationship with your children, build the Ramadan habits with your family, don't outsource it. Do things with your children, don't pick and drop them to things. Block out that quality time with them as families, not just if you have no children, as husband and wife. If you're not married, then with your housemates, then with your colleagues, with your neighbors, with your brothers and sisters. Do things communally, don't do things on your own, but build it internally, don't outsource it. Number two, fix the food culture. Have a minimal iftar, it's a one dish challenge. Can you live up to that challenge? One dish a day, no more, no less. And number three, the meanings of the Quran. Create a culture of reflection and thought 
and contemplation of, of the Quran at home. Make it a story, make it fun. Don't just stop at the recitation and the memorization. And with these three points, I leave all of you. Jazakumullah khairan for your time. Wa sallallahumma wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.